Okay, uh, good evening, uh, friends, and welcome once again to another session, online session of uh, Hyderabad Literary Festival. On my own behalf and on behalf of my colleagues, Ajay Gandhi, Amita Desai, and uh, Kinnera Murthy, I welcome you to this evening's session. And uh, unlike last time, uh, we are actually going live on YouTube too. So, um, and for that, I would like to thank my friend Ramakrishna of uh, Manbhum Construction Company, who has supported the, the online initiative of uh, HLF. Thank you, Ramakrishna. And uh, thanks to Ramakrishna's help, we are able to go live on YouTube. And uh, we had a technical glitch last time, and uh, but we managed to sort it out. And now I'm told that we are live on YouTube too. So, and we hope to continue like this um, to to be available in, on two different platforms, and uh, you know people who you know can choose between the platforms. So this evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, Tabesh Khair. Uh, Tabesh, of course, uh, many of you know, is uh, a well-known poet. He began as a poet, then transformed into a novelist, an academic. Uh, he teaches and lives in Denmark and uh, a literary critic. So there is hardly anything that uh, Tabesh has not done so far uh, because he also writes regularly. I, I really envy uh, the regularity with which he writes for uh, uh, for uh, newspapers, uh, weekly columns. So there is very little. I think the only thing that probably Tabish has not yet done so far is to probably write a play. Uh, I don't know if there is uh, one you know, tucked away somewhere. So probably you know, we can expect uh, that from Tabish as well. Tabish, of course, has, uh, uh, is no stranger to Hyderabad Literary Festival. He has been with us. And in fact, we were, uh, we were honored to release uh, his uh, book, uh, The New Xenophobia, a couple of years ago at uh, HLF, which was published by Oxford Books. And uh, so Tabish has been uh, a longtime supporter of HLF, and I'm delighted to welcome him back to uh, Hyderabad Literary Festival. And in conversation with Tabish this evening is Dr. Giridhar Rao. Um, Dr. Giridhar Rao teaches uh, and writes on uh, uh, language uh, politics, language uh, multilingualism, and he teaches courses at Azim Premji University on uh, the same and similar subjects. Uh, many of you must have received uh, the bios of both the authors, as well as uh, the book in focus today, uh, which is uh, Quarantine Sonnets, uh, Sex, Money, and Shakespeare. And uh, let me remind our viewers that uh, July is a special month for us because uh, the two events in July are uh, slightly different because we are focusing on absolutely recent books. Um, Tabish's book, uh, Quarantine Sonnets, was uh, released a couple of months ago, less than a couple of months ago in May, if I remember right. And uh, the next event that we are going to have in July is again a book which is actually not yet uh, released. Uh, it is getting released on 13th, and uh, we will have a session on this on 24th. And this is a book by a very uh, highly decorated and highly respected uh, general, General Panag, and uh, his book on the Indian Army uh, will be uh, in focus in our next session, which is on 24th of July. And uh, General Panag would be in conversation with Major General Shravan Kumar, and that will be again at 7 p.m. on Friday, 24th of July. Uh, of course, you will get more uh, information about uh, that event eventually. But uh, for this evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, I thank Tabish uh, coming to us live from uh, Denmark. Uh, thank you, Tabish, once again. And uh, uh, Tabish and uh, Giridhar Rao, both of you, uh, thank you very much. And now I invite both of you to take over and continue the conversation. And probably I will butt in uh, a little later uh, with questions from the audience and questions from my side as well, if there are any. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, over to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, Grida, if I might just thank Vijay, and then I'll let you take over. 
Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you, yeah, your colleagues, and and of course, Greta too. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Hyderabad Literature Festival is actually one of my favorite festivals, to be honest. Uh, and, and I'm not really a literature festival kind of writer. <laughs> so there are very few festivals where I feel comfortable. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be part of you again, if, if only through internet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tabish. Thank you, Tabish. Thank you, Vijay, um, for those introductions. And welcome to all of you. Um, from Bengaluru, where I am located. Um, and uh, um, let me um, let me dive in right away uh, into quarantine sonnets uh, with the dramatic subtitle of uh, Sex, Money, and Shakespeare. How can you go wrong with a title like that? Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the genesis of these collection, 21 sonnets, I believe. Uh, this collection of sonnets, yeah. give us a history. Yeah, uh, well, it started, I think, in the second week of the lockdown in Denmark. Uh, I mean, the, uh, and uh, I, I, a friend of mine, Anne Sophie Rivskow, who is a Shakespeare scholar, wrote to me and asked uh, me whether I would like to contribute a paper, a scholarly paper on Shakespeare sonnets. No, I'm a I'm a great admirer of Shakespeare. I can also say some 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 very cutting things about Shakespeare, but I'm a great admirer of Shakespeare and his sonnets, especially his sonnets. Um, and uh, and I thought, well, I, sh I I should at least reread the sonnets once more before I answer my friend. So I started rereading them, and because we were on in lockdown, uh, I started rewriting some of them just to kind of uh, you no know, keep myself distracted. <laughs> so I wrote two or three, and then I sent it to this friend and another friend of mine. And then I sort of started writing one every day or every second day or something, like rewriting these sonnets. Uh, and, and this friend said, oh, but you have to publish them. And I said, no, 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 no. This is it. I'm just doing it for fun. But, but it started off as being uh, sort of humorous sonnets about our times. But then because uh, the coronavirus crisis uh, what the virus crisis, which actually I would like to call uh, a human crisis, because it's more of a human crisis than a virus crisis, um, was was weighing down on, on on all of us. Obviously, the sonnets took a turn into the virus crisis, mm -hmm. and 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 that's how they were they developed. So I started using them to basically examine what was happening around us and why. Um, then once I had written about 20, I, I wrote 23, 24, I discarded some. Uh, so I, I decided that 21 would be a good number. Uh, the usual quarantine <laughs> day, you now three weeks, you have to isolate yourself. Uh, so, so then I started, because these friends were, were pushing me to publish it. So I, I wrote to a couple of people and uh, Kitab uh, very generously offered to bring it out as an ebook and donate its profits and my royalties to a migrant labor charity in Singapore. The Kitab is based in Singapore. Uh, so I thought, why, well, why not? I mean, if it gets a bit of money, gives people who need a bit of money, then why not? So that's how it came out. <laughs> Fascinating. Did the, did the title... Um... Was that hovering right from the beginning or did that evolve too? No, I think it, it was quite clear right from the beginning. Once I started thinking of it as a series, it was quite clear mm -hmm. that it would be quarantine. I mean, the question was whether it would be quarantine or quarantined. <laughs> so, yeah. and, 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 and money, sex and Shakespeare was right there. Actually, at first I thought I would call it money, sex and Shakespeare. But then we turned it around. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm glad you did because now it covers the entire period as well as it were right i mean there's a there's a context for it which is the primary context but then those those uh, um, poems themselves stand on their own um i i wanted to give the give our audience a flavor of uh, one of the sonnets at least um um shall we dive into that right away and then we can come to other questions is that all right yeah, that would be a good idea because a lot of people in the audience might not know what it is uh, what the book is uh, it's actually I mean, I, I myself have trouble thinking of it as a book because it's an ebook. I'm an old fashioned mm -hmm. person. If I cannot hold something in my hands and if it's not paper, then it's not really a book for me. <laughs> but but yeah, it would give, is, give people an idea. And there is a lot of paper behind you. Yes, I can see. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I, li I live with paper. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So uh, uh, what we, 
one one possibility is that um, um, I read out um, a, a fairly well known sonnet, mm -hmm. sonnet eighteen. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Mm -hmm. And then uh, you tell you read out your version of that sonnet to see what sure. you what so the audience gets a sense of what the original sounds like yeah. and uh, what you've done with it. Is that okay. is that okay? Sure, no, that's that's a very yeah. good idea. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Giri, uh, Giri, can your uh, audio be a little better? Um, is this is this better? Yeah. Yeah. That's you better. Tell me if it's not, if it's not clear. Is, is there crackling or is it too no, loud? No, no. It's um, it's uh, it's uh, sounding as if uh, you are speaking from a distance. Oh, uh, no. It's quite okay. close to my lips. It's okay. 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 Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So this is uh, um, the famous sonnet eighteen. Um, by Shakespeare, um, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves are Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and oft is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines. By chance, or nature's changing course, untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death drag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll read out my version, but I'll see a few things about it. See, one of the things that a number of things that attracted me to some of Shakespeare's sonnets. Uh, very often, it was, of course, a turn of phrase. But uh, because I have been very seriously interested in Shakespeare's sonnets for a long time, I was also aware of certain other things. For instance, this sonnet is one of Shakespeare's great love sonnets. It's also quite a standard love sonnet, unlike say. Uh, the, the sonnet in which uh, he, he he compares his mistress uh, um, uh, mistress's hair to to black wires. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I mean that 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 uh, in sonnets like that, Shakespeare basically uh, writes against the tradition of love poetry that existed. But in this sonnet, he actually sticks close to that tradition, quite close. Um, and uh, and of course, this is a love sonnet. Love, love for someone else. It's 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 about uh, death and the possibility of uh, immortality and all that. Um, so for a number of reasons, this sonnet attracted me, and I found a voice for this sonnet. Now, most all my sonnets have been uttered by different voices. Yeah. The voice of the sonnet is that of a famous uh, international leader who is a great lover of himself. Uh, and uh, and the various reasons why this sonnet lends itself to his voice. So now I'll read, read out my adaptation. I shall compare it to a miracle. It's here now, but will be gone by April. From five to zero, said an oracle, I trust on Foxy News, I have the skill and understand this virus a little. Just take a pill of this gobbledygook and stay away from your yes, Chinese hospital. Do you know I'm number one on Facebook? Just wait until the eye of heaven shines. It is a bug that killed by summer's heat. A hundred thousand dead by June? That's fine. It's a still a great success, yes, quite a feat. Something I'm sure my voters will remember and make us great again in November. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That is great. Um, that that um, um, that use of uh, um, uh, heaven. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah. Eye of heaven and, and similar. Of, just wait <laughs> until the eye of heaven shines. Uh, uh, That's really inspired. Um, <laughs> That it takes it takes a line from the original um, and casts it uh, into a completely different um, idiom, into, exactly. into a completely different thing. I mean, 
it's yeah. not just tropical, but it's also tropical, right? I mean, just wait until the eye of heaven shines. Yes. Um, <laughs> only a, only somebody from the tropics knows just that the eye of heaven can kill. Uh, I, I don't think uh, the original Shakespeare sonnet could have been written in the tropics. Uh, uh, if you choose to compare your beloved to uh, no. summer's day, um, no. it might have unfortunate consequences. Uh, so, definitely. Uh, the, the beloved wouldn't be very, very impressed anyway. I mean, we, we, we prefer the moon. <laughs> and the, the shade of the tresses yes. and the eyelashes exactly. and so on. Um, exactly. so that, that was another uh, thing that struck me, that um, uh, in this sonnet, for example, um, did, you, did you look at the sonnet and see how it could be adapted uh, uh, and transformed into something else? Or, um, or did the, a theme uh, come first, and you wonder uh, which sonnet would suit this kind of yeah. treatment uh, for this treating yeah. this theme. Is uh, there a before uh, and after, or do they yeah. grow simultaneously? I, I, I think that's a very difficult question to answer, and and, and it's difficult question question to answer about literature in general, in the sense that how does it really connect? Because there's, uh, um, I mean, there's a kind of give and take. Now, there were certain themes I had in mind. There were certain sonnets that spoke to me. Um, but at one level, there's a kind of gut feeling, a kind of voice in your head that says, this is the sonnet that will do that. Uh, and, 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 and I think it's, it's, it, it, that's, if there's anything called creativity, that is probably what creativity is. Um, it's something you cannot really pinpoint. You just have a feeling that this is, this is what the sonnet can be turned into. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and I think to some extent that happens with all kinds of literature in the sense that at, at a certain level you have to trust your instincts and you have to of course push for what you want but you also have to listen and and wait for something to come to you. Uh, there's mm -hmm. uh, there's always you know, a two-way traffic. So that, that's how mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean. Th um, it also is the fact that you've lived with these sonnets for many years, yeah. uh, so they are friends of yours, so to speak. Definitely. Uh, so Definitely. in some, in some, in some sense, the book has been in gestation for a while, uh, yeah. even though it didn't take this form until now. Yeah. Um, and uh, which, which asks, which one prompts me to think about what the form of the sonnet does for you. Um, why is it that it is? Uh, what, what is? Uh, how do you find the form itself? both enabling and perhaps even challenging? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I think the form of the sonnet has, has a peculiar appeal. I don't know whether it has something to do with the way English works uh, as a language. Uh, I've always found it actually sometimes frighteningly easy to write sonnets. And, and that's why mm. I don't publish sonnets when I write them, because sometimes I feel that they just come too easily. Uh, and uh, uh, but uh, but and I have published a few sonnets sonnets of my own in the past too, uh, but very few. I mean, I usually because I, I find the form a bit. I I I I'm 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 not convinced by the ease with which I can write a sonnet in 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 in, in technical terms. No, I'm big pentameter and all the rest. Uh, it it just happens too too quickly. Uh, so in this case, because I was rewriting Shakespeare's sonnet, I put that aside. But if I had actually written 21 sonnets of my own, I would have been very skeptical. I would have looked at it and said, like, what is this? I mean, am I just indulging in some kind of mechanical act? Or do I still have, do I actually have something to say? Is it, is it, uh, so, so in this case, that was not the case. And, I, and Shakespeare saved me by standing there at my shield. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I, 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 I think uh, one of the biggest problems for Indian writers, Indian English writers in English, uh, is hmm. that uh, uh, the way we speak English is more or less standard, but mm -hmm. we we stress words differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so when we write in um, um, in meter and rhyme, mm -hmm. we we obviously write the way we hear those words and that's the way we should. And that's mm -hmm. exactly the reason why Indian English poetry written in meter and rhyme apart from Vikram Seth and Dom Moraes <laughs> never makes it internationally. Because uh, be because even though they might be very open to Creoles and all the rest of it and its street language, 
they are not open to the fact that we express certain words differently. That is still seen as an error, not as an Indian way of pronouncing that word or a North Indian way or South Indian way of pronouncing that word. So that's another reason why when one writes in meter and rhyme, uh, one actually ends up writing only within India for an Indian English circle, unless one, one adopts a very international intonation, which despite being great, Poets is the case with Vikram Seth and mm -hmm. and Omaris. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, they, they they write very upper class international English. Uh, their stresses are all in the right place, uh, mm -hmm. which is not the case with my English, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the case with most other Indian English writers who write in English from India. Uh, mm -hmm. so, 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 because you asked me about the sonnet, I mean, that is actually one of the problems with the sonnet. It, it does come quite easily, but it doesn't necessarily translate to, especially, English editors and readers as easily. American editors and readers are more open to it. That's my impression, mm -hmm. for some reason. Maybe because they have gone through uh, something similar. Mm -hmm. But British readers and uh, editors are not open to it. They, they'll be open to Creoles, they'll be open to slang, they'll be open to lots of street language, but they won't be open to the fact that you write a standard English, but you stress certain vowels differently. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yeah, it has not struck me. Have you experimented with other forms? Uh, this is, I know, a conversation about sonnets, but have you tried uh, to submit to the discipline of um, other um, verse forms? I, I have usually short short lyrics. Uh, I've written longer poems, but I've never published them, and usually I haven't even kept them. Um, but uh, but some short lyrics I have published, uh, and uh, I mean, when I publish in the days when I used to write poetry, which has become very difficult now with with all my my academic work and all the rest of it, poetry I think requires much more space than many other kinds of writing, at least for me. Uh, so so in the days when I used to. Um, um, I, I, I found it easy actually to move in and out of meter, in and out of rhyme, use half, half rhymes and so on and so forth. Uh, that was my way to actually uh, speak the way I want to speak, but not be accused of not really mm -hmm. writing well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, ask you to read another sonnet, but before that I had a, a question. Um, sure. Is my audience... Is my audio slightly better now? I'm, I'm holding this to my mouth to hopefully... Vijay? No, it isn't any better. Uh, uh, so I don't so, know what is uh, the problem. Because, uh, yeah. It, it, it was, I don't know either. It was, it was fine uh, uh, an hour ago in another session. Hmm. This is so I, uh, I'm saying Zoom. Zoom yeah, session. anyway, that's, uh, that's okay. all we can do. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, my friends all over. But, but by the way, Grida, I can see there are lots of people from your audience, uh, audience asking me questions. I was just wondering. Uh, uh, um, Tabish, uh, we will take the questions a little later. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah I, I have one, one last uh, uh, thought to offer, uh, which was that uh, today's Indian Express has a, has a um, piece by um, Tanuja, Tanuja Khotial on um, uh, hardening boundaries um, uh, between, um, as a result of the pandemic, uh, that boundaries between countries, boundaries between states, districts, boundaries within the uh, houses or at least uh, housing societies and so on, everywhere there is a certain hardening of uh, I and thou, and me and you, uh, you and not you, and so on. And uh, uh, the author speculates that this may be something that is um, that, that then that has she's saying that this has happened because of the uh, because of the pandemic. On the other hand, what you have done in your in this volume is uh, dissolve boundaries, is it not? Um, you have taken um, um, and you've done it in a particular way because you you are coming from a certain uh, set of locations. Um, an Indian who grew up largely in India, um, speaking uh, Urdu, Hindi, and English, um, and then later learned other languages, uh, works as an academic, but not in the usual uh, uh, Anglophone locations um, in an in Indian university, UK, US, Australia, and New Zealand, but in Denmark, um, a Western European, continental European uh, country. Um, these are a set of, um, dislocations or uh, discontinuities, if you like, 
and then you take a canonical set of sonnets shakespeare's what more canonic how much more canonical can it get and uh, do something quite extraordinary with them you open them up to all kinds of uh, questions as you said in multiple voices so that uh, quest each poem is being uh, uh, spoken by a different uh, actor a different yeah. differently located person and amidst all this you do a one more act of dislocation which is invoke uh, virtual social media facebook instagram twitter uh, yeah. those sonnets abound with references to those spaces which is a different entirely different dislocation so i was just wondering uh, if all those discontinuities and uh, the merging of boundaries that you have achieved in this or the dissolving of boundaries uh, that you have achieved in these poems are a result of your uh, particular trajectory as a um, poet of the world let us say um, who has moved in so many different places uh, would you agree that i mean i was thinking actually of one more connection which is your 2011 book um, uh, on reading uh, literature modern uh, reading modern literature with dubinsky uh, where you speak about uh, how precisely uh, noticing gaps noticing discontinuities uh, opens up uh, a rich experience of literature so i was wondering in fact whether our response to your book your ebook uh, is precisely because uh, you have opened up those spaces by functioning within many gaps within many many ways i wonder if that uh, no I, i i i i would definitely i mean if 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 someone says so or if someone says what you have said i would i would consider that a compliment and i would hope that that is exactly what i have achieved uh, mm -hmm. um uh, and and obviously my own personal trajectory does have a lot to uh ha has a role to play in that uh, because mm -hmm. uh, i mean i grew up in bihar gaya i was 24 25 when i left the town for the first time i worked in delhi for 4 5 years and then i moved to denmark uh and after that even though i have spent a semester in england the semester here as a guest teacher it's all been when i have been in my late 40s early 50s <laughs> so so uh, and and it's just been a semester now and then um so uh and and in that sense uh, the way in which i connect to the world might be slightly different from the way in which some other good writers from india would connect mm. to it I, i i would hope so so that 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 matter of continuity and discontinuity becomes uh, uh at least uh, it it put in a different context for me or someone like me mm. um mm. the the other thing about about what's been happening uh, right from the beginning uh, because even in the first year uh, first week of the lockdown or something i was asked to do a webinar by a young indian scholar who has very kindly written about me professor om dewi wedi um and and this was on um, the virus crisis and the future and and right even quite early i my general position was first of all that we cannot talk of the virus crisis as something unusual mm -hmm. the worst thing that are happening are happening because of things which were already in place Mm -hmm. socio economic divide neglect of health neglect of education neglect of scientific thinking all of it was already in place uh mm -hmm. as, as well as of course uh, um environmental degradation i mean viruses we know erupt mm -hmm. when uh, mm -hmm. ecological crises happen uh, so so all those things were already there uh, and and in that sense i felt that the way we were coping with it was replete with 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 lines of connections and walls of repulsion at the same mm -hmm. time and of course you can see how this has happened for instance uh, usa 3 or 4 weeks back 30 million people unemployed uh, but the top uh, 30 or 40 billion as in you they have made something like 600 billion uh, dollars worth of money or something like that so obviously it's like right at the start people people would say oh we are all in the same boat now this virus will affect all of us but mm. no we are not in the same boat some mm. people are in luxury cruisers and some mm. people are, are are in leaking rafts and hanging on mm. for their life so i think those elements were there when i thought of both continuity and discontinuity and, and that was definitely part of what i was trying to do 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this brings us very neatly to your um, role as a public intellectual, something that Vijay wanted to uh, talk to you about. Um, should we do a sonnet before you, uh, Vijay, begins? Sure. Entirely. I'm, 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 you're the host, so I'll do whatever you ask me to do. <laughs> Vijay? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So, sh- should I just read any? Or, any, or any would you rather jump in no. right away? No, no, no. Oh. no, no. I, I mean, go ahead. I think you, you, you can end with a sonnet. So, oh, no, Grita, do you want to read one or do you want me to read one? No, no, no. I, I wanted you to read. Oh, sure. But we can end with. So, I mean, what I can do is, is I, I, I'll read out the last sonnet. Uh, and this has, a, yeah, this has a different voice too. Uh, and I let you, I let your audience uh, discover the voice, which uh, you'll discover toward the end of the sonnet. This is based on a sonnet that uh, in Shakespeare's collection, it starts with the lines, with the lines, tired with all these for restful death, I cry. Mine starts like this. This is my my adaptation. Tired of people for proper life we prayed. And then suddenly it happened, a quiet fell upon earth. We saw pollution fade and hardly any human was in sight. At first we hesitated and then the trees filled with birds, the public squares with bird songs. We occupied the parks. In Japanese cities, the seeker deer promenaded in throngs, and prides of lions settled on Kenyan roads, and seals on docks, and whales swam close to shore, and towns belonged to hares, and bears, and goats. But now this too has passed into our law. As chimneys spew poison as in the past, I tell my pups it was too good to last. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, both uh, Giri as well as Tabesh. Uh, wonderful conversation. Um, I have a, a few questions. Um, uh, that that actually come from what uh, Tabesh has said. But before I do that, um, a, a few preliminary questions uh, for the benefit of our uh, audience, all of whom may not have the background to this sonnet. Uh, Tabish, we all know that uh, Shakespeare has written about 160 or so sonnets. 154, 154. Yeah, officially that was published in the yeah. and 154 then, yeah. and then yeah. six that he wrote in other yeah. plays. Exactly. So uh, 160, if we say that. Mm-hmm. Um, and how did you choose these 21? Yeah, uh, well, I was, I was reading reading the sonnets and then I would say some of them spoke to me. I mean, I had this, some of these stories I wanted to tell. For instance, I wanted a sonnet to talk of what's happening in Wally Street, a speculator, mm-hmm. basically speculating on this misery. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted us on to tell, uh, to, 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 to give us uh, the version of a nurse fighting to save people, but exposed to the virus herself. So, so I had these stories in mind. Sometimes I even had entire lines in mind, mm-hmm. like uh, the, the sonnet I wrote that contains lines by President Trump mm. and our lines from his speeches. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the sonnet by the nurse contains a line that is actually taken from an essay by an American nurse who mm. basically ended by saying, saying that uh, when, I, when I die, uh, don't forget me. Don't forget this, take this up, fight for me. Uh, so, 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 and the last line is basically from my essay. So I had these ideas and then I was rereading the sonnets uh, and then I felt this sonnet actually can be rewritten to actually explore that particular voice or idea. And then I worked on it. Sometimes I abandoned the idea, sometimes, <laughs> and, and then, I, then I put it aside and I tried it with some other sonnet after a few days, but that was basically the way it, it went. I mean, I was basically rereading the sonnets. I had nothing else to do. There was some uh, teaching uh, to be done, but it was all online. <laughs> so I was home uh, and, uh, and, and and that's how it went about. 
so uh, what what did you take from the original sonnets of course the sonnet form yeah. apart from that is it the tone or is it the persona or is it the theme uh, what exactly did you take and what did you add to the originals yeah, yeah. different things i think some sonnets it was more the turn of a phrase mm. that actually fitted in with what I was saying. Some sonnet it was something larger, like exactly what Shakespeare was trying to do. Mm. I mean, the, the very first sonnet, because the first six sonnets are quite general ones about basically the times. And the first sonnet, uh, which was not the first sonnet, I think I wrote it, which was the fourth or fifth sonnet that I wrote. I rearranged the sonnets, which, which scholars argue Shakespeare probably did with the 154 that appeared as well. Though, of course, being Shakespeare and his scholars, they are always fighting each other. Uh, I mean, the only place where you come across more dead bodies than in the last scene of one of Shakespeare's tragedies is during a Shakespeare <laughs> conference. <laughs> so, there's blood everywhere. <laughs> so, that's yeah. my vision anyway. So, yeah. uh, and... Uh, yeah, so 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 uh, the, the, the first sonnet is actually um, I, I I take up uh, Shakespeare's common exhortation to his beloved to basically no that to think highly of him because he's this great writer he'll make her him immortal uh, and uh, and 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 that sonnet obviously lends itself to what I say which is a writer basically making the same point, but at the end of it saying like, don't ask me how much I get as royalties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so, so, so it, it, it depended, it depended. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's interesting um, uh, that you chose these uh, 21 sonnets and also connected it to the mandatory 21 days of uh, you know quarantine. Uh, but also I would like you to explain the subtitle uh, to the, the, the tone variations in the poems, because uh, like Shakespeare's, uh, or I think nearly 120 or endowed sonnets have one kind of a tone, yeah. and then later on it changes. Yeah. So similarly in your uh, ebook, yeah. the, the tone quite visibly changes yeah. or audibly changes, yeah. uh, you know, from, from uh, the beginning to the end. Yeah. So could you, could you uh, explain those uh, variations? Yeah, I, I mean, as you would know, I mean, there's an argument that Shakespeare probably rearranged the sonnets, uh, 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 so they move towards a darker mood, and and the, and, and the tone changes uh, as a consequence. Uh, um, and uh, I, I think I did a bit of that too, obviously. But though, I mean, to be honest, the first four or five sonnets I wrote were actually lighter sonnets because I was just doing it. No, as an exercise, mm -hmm. and then once, the, and then yeah, then I became aware that this was going to be a document, some kind of record of what's happening, and then obviously the tone did change. But I, I rearranged some of the sonnets a bit so that I start with 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 a humorous, lighter tone, and it gets darker and darker and darker, and 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 it ends up getting more acerbic, uh, much more critical, not just of politicians but also as the last sonnet indicates yes. of the human species in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, that's why, you know, because uh, the, the final product of uh, both Shakespeare as well as yours has a clear transition from being a lighter in tone to more darker and uh, towards the end more uh, acerbic, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, right? So yeah. in that sense, uh, you know, to, to, to somebody who looks at and compares the two uh, sets of sonnets, uh, it would seem that you have also, in a way, um, you know, imitated the same kind of a tonal variations, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah I, I, I did try to do something like that. I had that mm. in mind quite early on. Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, but um, you know, I, I also would like you to connect these sonnets to some of your other writings, uh, because um, you know. Off late, you have been uh, writing about, uh, let's say, your novels, particularly uh, whether it is uh, just another, you know, jihadi chain or uh, how to fight uh, Islamist terror, etc. Uh, because one of the things that you just said was about uh, different voices, both in Shakespeare as well as in your own uh, writing, and uh, your novels too adopt different personas. Uh, for example, in the Jihadi Jane, you write it from the point of view of a Yorkshire girl. And then uh, in um, 
uh, the other one on uh, what is that night um, night of happiness night of happiness mm-hmm. night of happiness you adopt the persona of a, a hindu businessman yeah. right and in how to fight islamist terror you adopt the persona of a middle aged um, or a youngish yeah, uh, pakistani yeah. uh, you know young man yeah, so yeah. in different novels you adopt different personas is it is it uh, one way of um, i mean how do, how do you adopt that persona i mean yeah. how do you choose that persona yeah, yeah. I, i i think quite early on um, one of the things that has always uh, attracted me to literature uh, to to what people call creative literature <laughs> is exactly the fact that it makes you enter other spaces uh, not just other spaces in the sense of greece or bihar or or, or tamil nadu uh, but uh, i think something happened i'm being told that i i have been muted oh yeah okay no, no. <laughs> so okay uh, so and uh, uh but other spaces in the sense of other people i mean that that that's the space most difficult to enter another yes. Uh, yes. sentient being uh, and uh, and and uh, i think creative literature enables you to do it um but along with that of course there comes a lot of responsibility uh because it's one thing to try and enter space and another thing to colonize it mm-hmm. uh, to to take it over uh and and to turn it into your own version of whatever it is so so for me that that tussle that struggle is what actually i find most challenging yeah. and most beautiful about my career as uh, as a creative writer mm. because i remember one of the one of the early reviews of uh, jihadi jain said that it is unbelievable that this is written by a male uh, and yeah. uh, not not a woman and that that's so happy <laughs> and that, and that to an indian male uh, and not a british uh, you know girl yeah. right so um but uh, you know th- this line that you uh, very carefully tread of what you said um, speaking in the voice of somebody else but at the same time not uh, making that voice like a you know echo of your own self yeah. right uh, i would uh, like you to connect that to you know your own um, because you have been writing you know quite regularly about religion yeah. and and uh, its different forms of religion and uh, you have treaded that line very very carefully about uh, being a believer and at the same time being very trenchant critic yeah. of um, you know all these uh, of, uh, you know kinds of religion right so could you t- could you tell us uh, a little bit more about your equation with religion sure. um yeah i mean i i must say that i have to write a book on religion in due course uh but i'm waiting until i'm fairly old uh mm. just in case <laughs> so, um but uh, but honestly i i i feel that the kind of division that some people make between religious belief and disbelief mm. i find it very difficult to sustain that division because when i look at and i'll i'll illustrate, illustrate it in a simple way but i can make it more complex if we had more time but i'll just illustrate it in a simple way uh if you think of any religion any any kind of religious belief let's say religion in general you believe in some kind of god or some kind of uh, no some 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 kind of power whatever however you might see it okay uh now there are two ways you can approach it uh, you can say that i don't really know i i am not in control of everything all i can do is be open to whatever is around me i can do what is what i think is right for me but i can never tell you what you should do because i am not god i can never be god i cannot read the mind of god okay you can have one position like that the other position would be this is what my god says if you don't do it off with your head okay so you can see that division and similarly if you move on to on to atheism you can have a similar division you can say i don't know what exists what doesn't exist maybe there is a god maybe there is no god i don't believe in a god maybe but that's your headache okay <laughs> i just say oh if you believe in a god you are an idiot mm. <laughs> so 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 for me that division runs on both sides right <laughs> yeah and of course uh, you have um, 
uh, you know, you, your initial uh, move from Gaya to Delhi also it has something to do with uh, how you upset a few, uh, you know, Islamists, and then yeah. uh, you had to move and so on. Yeah. Um, but, but the, but, you know, uh, again, this um, taking on different personas, is it a way of also, you know, uh, related to what you said about Shakespeare being very clever, uh, saying what you want to say and yet retaining your head. Yeah. Uh, is that also, uh, you know, something to do with that? Definitely, oh, definitely. I mean, that, 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 that's one of the things about, about creative writing, about literature in general, in the sense that, uh, I mean, it might be that some people might be put in the position where they have to choose between saying what they want to say and retaining their head. Uh, <laughs> but in most cases, you can say what you want to say without getting your head chopped off. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that is part of the skill of being a writer. Uh, and uh, I personally believe that you can do it. And, uh, and I think I've been doing that for a long time. I've been saying things uh, to people on all sides of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I've not really been lying. I mean, I've not been lying at all. I've been saying things as I want to say them. And uh, I can feel that more and more people have started listening to me. Maybe what happened to me as a young man mm -hmm. was a lesson because uh, even though I did not say anything radical, mm -hmm. the way I said it, was that of a young man. Mm. Well, I was out there to provoke people and, uh, and prove that I was smarter than others. And, 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 and those are not necessarily the, the, the ways one needs to adopt most of the time. <laughs> yeah, in fact, it was, I think, Borges who said that censorship is the mother of metaphor. Uh, so I think the more uh, uh, you know, pressure there is, I think the more metaphorical the writers will become, right? <laughs> Um, but uh, I, I'm also interested uh, to know a little bit more about uh, your uh, extremely powerful book, uh, The New Xenophobia. And uh, I, I want you to uh, tell us a little bit more about what you mean by new xenophobia and how is it different from the old xenophobia? Uh, because I think that was, uh, although it came about four years earlier, four years ago, it is so prescient, you know, because it talks about strangers and how you invent uh, strangers. And if there are no strangers, how you invent strangers from your own people that you are, you know, that that are familiar to you. So please tell us about, you know, how do you connect what you said about in new xenophobia to the present situation where we are, where everybody suddenly now becomes a potential uh, enemy. Uh, well, I, I think I think my main uh, uh, angle in that book was uh, my increasing awareness of a kind of difference in the history of capitalism, mm -hmm. which I personally, uh, I'm not an economist, so I personally um, uh, define in terms of capitalism and neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's a very obvious difference in the sense that under capitalism, the kind of capitalism Karl Marx criticized or Adam Smith celebrated, whatever it might be, um, there's a very obvious relationship between production, worker, capital. So mm -hmm. production, worker, capital, trade, these are all com completely tied in. And then you can talk of whether the worker is being exploited or not. Okay? Under neoliberalism, production is almost incidental. Uh, much of the money just circulates as number, the speculation. Uh, you, 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 you can take uh, functioning factories and shut them down, rip them apart and make money. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can just play around on your computer and not produce anything at all and make money. Okay. So, so obviously when something like this has happened, then I, want, I wanted to ask myself, what is it, what is it that this will do to, to the human being, the worker, the stranger? In what ways would these human beings be occluded, obscured, exploited? And obviously, if there are changes, then that will impact on the way strangers will be constructed, will be dealt with, and will be uh, even covered or not covered by the media. So that yeah. was basically what I tried to do in, in that book. Let me, let me end with uh, something probably uh, which is... Uh... Uh, that is running through your writing, where you look at um, different kinds of, um, uh, if I mean, for, for uh, you know, for no, since I can't think of a better word, you know, the kind of um, 
fundamentalism that is whether it is um, you know whether it is trump whether it is uh, the radical hinduism or the radical islamism that you uh, talk right about that you connect it to power hmm. right and uh, you also uh, you know say in uh, new xenophobia that um, you know the kind of um, uh, the kind of wahhabism that you uh, that we see in some quarters is something alien to indian muslim culture right so uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that sure yeah i mean to start with a smaller uh, answer when I mean, yeah. wahhabism of course comes from saudi arabia by mm. and large okay yeah. i mean there were various other kinds of uh, islamist uh, islamic fundamentalism mm. but wahhabism is a particular concoction yeah. uh, and it comes with petromoney and and much much, much of indian uh, or at least the cultural parts of indian uh, Mus uh, indian muslim cultures uh, mm. have uh, have been influenced more of by iran and persian uh, mm. uh, societies historically i mean for instance um, we all grew up saying uh, khuda hafiz mm. khuda now all religious muslims say allah hafiz mm. now allah hafiz did not exist as a word in urdu mm. uh, it it had been used because some muslims assume that khuda is is a persian word so it's not the right word so we shouldn't use it mm. but culturally when you said allah hafiz in in urdu you would say something like ye to allah hafiz which mm. means that this person is so gone that only allah can take care of him mm. it was not used as an equivalent of khuda hafiz this is a new development mm -hmm. so, so in that sense obviously i mean that's what i mean that this kind of wahhabism is is alien to indian cultural traditions uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it has a lot to do with uh, the resurgence of saudi arabia its uh, development as a buffer state uh, by western powers especially usa mm -hmm. and uh, the proliferation of petromoney which mm -hmm. has obviously impacted on a lot of other people mm -hmm. uh, so 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 that 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 was basically what i meant with 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 that yeah so um let me take a, a few questions um you know one of them was about uh, uh, just a minute let me see if i can put it out about the uh, why um this is from i think saikrat uh where he asks um uh do you think um okay why sonnets my question to you is why sonnets do you think the volta in a sonnet can be equated to the sudden apocalyptic shift in <laughs> that the world is facing that that's very interesting I mean, yeah, well I, you, you know the volta and the sonnet is a is, to a large extent a kind of distinctive shakespearean mm. uh, addition to the sonnet in particular because the way he turns it around is what not done before that i mean he mm. he, he can just turn the argument all the way around yeah. so, uh, and that's one of the reasons i love his sonnets actually <laughs> that he can develop an argument and hit you with a hammer towards the end with the last one <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and 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 what what you ask about about that kind of shift I think that is important. I would not call it apocalyptic, but I would say shift in thinking, shift in interrogating an an argument. And I think the sonnet, especially in its Shakespearean form, appeals to me partly because of that, because of that that tradition that mm -hmm. I can I can draw upon. Um, but um, I think the other thing about the sonnet that has to be kept in mind is that it's a very precise form. that mm -hmm. many lines and so on and so forth it mm -hmm. also allows you more freedom in terms of uh, rhyme schemes than say certain other uh, traditional forms would so so there are there are various reasons why the sonnet actually ends up being an interesting form in which you can write descriptive poetry uh, as well as interrogative poetry i think mm -hmm. that's probably what makes the sonnet most interesting it's it's it it it, it you can write interrogative poetry <laughs> with the sonnet form <laughs> interesting uh, and i was uh, quite um, surprised when you said that uh, sonnet is a very easy form to write because i remember uh, the i think it was uh, uh, the caribbean poet um, not derek walker but um, uh, kwame uh, kwame ah. uh, um, um, you know he says that um, the iambic pentameter doesn't blow uh, sorry the 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 hurricane yeah. in the caribbean doesn't flow yeah. doesn't 
Which is that Brat Brathwaite? Brathwaite. Kamal Brathwaite. Yeah, Kamal Brathwaite, who says that uh, the 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 harmattan or the hurricane yeah. in the yeah. Caribbean doesn't uh, blow in uh, the iambic yeah. pentameter. No, no. So, so um, no, I'm, yeah. I'm a great admirer of Brathwaite too. I mean, yeah. he passed away just a year ago. Or so. I know. I know. Big loss to to. Mm. to I mean, unfortunately, I don't think he ever got the kind of recognition he did, mm. deserved because, uh, I mean, Derek Walcott, who was, again, of course, a great poet, yes. <laughs> like mm. occupied a lot of the space and people like Brathwaite. Brathwaite also went back to the Caribbean in a big way. True, true. Uh, so, which is, so there, there were lots of things like that. Mm. No, I, and, 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 and I totally agree. I totally agree with that. And that might be the reason why I'm so, so suspicious of mm. the song when I write it, in the sense that if Shakespeare hadn't been there, if I hadn't been able to hold up Shakespeare as a shield, as I said, I might, I would have written these sonnets, shared them with friends, and destroyed mm. them. Uh, I mean, <laughs> so, so I, I, I find the sonnet form easy to write in a mechanical way, yeah. but when it actually manages to communicate my reality, that is more difficult. Yeah. That is difficult. yeah. I think yeah. what you said about, uh, you know, sonnet being, uh, you know, strict in terms of a limited space, everything has to be said in 14 lines, right? So that in a way uh, imposes a certain discipline on, on the writer, right? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, again, uh, to, to, you know, one of the questions that was asked was, um, uh, uh, you said you write uh, when, um, when you have to, yeah. uh, not when you want to. Yeah. So what exactly is, um, you know, what did you mean by that? Is it, is it, uh, I know what you meant was that uh, there is a compulsion to write and you have to write only when you feel compelled to write and there is no choice. No. Uh, is that what you meant? Yeah, exactly. And, and the other thing I, I, I meant is that, I mean, writing is a, is a weird kind of activity. I, I, I'm very sure painting or, or probably singing, I have, I have a, miserable voice I, I can never sing <laughs> would be similar now mm -hmm. but I can only talk of writing it, 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 it it's, it's a very difficult activity because no matter what you do you always feel that it's not enough always feel that it could be better uh, as, as, I mean there's a point where you stand back and you look at it and you say okay this is good enough it can be published mm -hmm. but if, in the process of writing most of the time what you feel is a degree of dissatisfaction with what you're doing you mm -hmm. feel that actually what you're writing about deserved something better <laughs> and that you could do it just a bit better you keep on working on it and maybe you do reach a phase where it does become as good as it can be so in that sense I mean why write unless you have to yeah, I mean, it's, not, it's not a pleasurable activity. <laughs> Why not drink a glass of wine or eat some sandesh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose you definitely did not mean that you have to write only when you find a publisher. No, no not at yeah. all. Not yeah. at all. No, that's that, that, that's the last of. Uh, I know. It's I nice know. to have a publisher, but that's the last of worries. I mean, yeah, especially these days. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and also there is one question which has come from um, the. Uh, Facebook. Um, actually, this is something connected to what I was thinking that, uh, you know, translation very often is considered rewriting, a sort of rewriting. So by that same logic, can rewriting be considered translation? <laughs> and the connected question to that is uh, being asked uh, on the Facebook, which is uh, how is rewriting considered in the academic circles? Yeah. You know, is it is it taken seriously? And is it given uh, how is how how creative is a rewriting considered by the academia? Uh, both are very difficult questions. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll I'll try and answer them. I, I I wouldn't even call translation rewriting. I would call translation writing, mm. in the sense that I mean, when when I uh, one of my novels that translated into a language I can read, like say Danish or Hindi, uh, I I do not read the translation. Mm. Uh, I'm grateful that someone wants to translate it. I'm grateful that it's been done. Mm -hmm. But once I have decided to let someone translate it, I feel it is that person's book. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can only read it as a reader. I cannot read it as the author of that book. Of the original. Uh, yeah, exactly. So so, so I, I, I think translation is just as creative. Creative in a different way. I'm not yeah. saying you can just write anything you want. <laughs> no, mm. It's creative in a different way. Okay, but it's a creative activity, and what comes out of it is 
has an identity of its own. It's not a sh the shadow of my book. It's mm. a book on its own. Uh, so, so I, I, I think that's what I would say about about the relationship. Mm. About academics, I mean, to be honest, I mean, all three of us are academics. That's where we <laughs> we earn our bread and butter. But, uh, but I mean, sometimes it's good when things are not taken too seriously in academia. Mm. <laughs> it's good for those things sometimes. <laughs> So, so, if, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think academia really comes to grips with creative translations, uh, even though there's more and more acceptance that translation is a free activity of its own in, in, in translation studies and so on and so forth. But the notion of creative translation or, or, or when it grapples with it, then it will grapple with it in terms of theory, which becomes another kind of book. Anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so so that that's my position. I'm not like I'm I'm always grateful when academics look at my stuff, um, but but I, I left to myself, I would much rather actually just have readers mm -hmm. and more readers. <laughs> I think sometimes it is good uh, not to be part of uh, academics. <laughs> um, there is one more question. This is from uh, Amina Kishore. Uh, she says uh, your explanation regarding. Uh, Re response to voice in the original is interesting. It's a kind of transcreation, isn't it? Yeah. Your sonnets are more heavy footed, anxious, dark. Mm -hmm. Is the present too much with you? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, yeah, I, no one, yes. I mean, the present is with me. I mean, that's it's inevitable in the sense that. I can only be in the present. Uh, but but if you but if, if if you mean by it, am I am I dis, despondent about what is happening? Mm -hmm. I would say no. Despite all the criticism, everything I've said, I said I'll say no. I'm not despondent about what is happening. I am critical about what went before that, mm -hmm. and and I'm critical about the fact that all of what went before that and that led to this situation is still not being addressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, 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 so I think there's a difference there. I mean, the present is all we have. I mean, how can one despair of the present? I mean, what else does one have? But the and, present, and, and, and to think that Shakespeare's time was any less uh, uh, difficult. The plague. <laughs> yes, and uh, and, he, and he could get his head chopped off much more easily than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but since you talked about how uh, the the. Uh, situation which led to this crisis still remains unaddressed. Yeah. And uh, you have also written about uh, what your thoughts are on the post, uh, you know, uh, COVID or post pandemic uh, projection. What is your take on that? Well, to be honest, uh, what I feel is that, uh, uh, I mean, it's at, at various levels, at, at the health level, let's be honest and say that many of the casualties could have been avoided if various governments, including first world governments, I'm talking of places like UK, mm. supposed to have a health welfare system. America, okay, it's all privatized, mm. uh, dream world, uh, everything is privatized. <laughs> so, uh, but but UK does have it and, and some other countries. Uh, and, and many of these, these fatalities could have been avoided if people had just carefully followed the rule book. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, old people's houses, people were left exposed in those houses. Why couldn't? And, and, and they were exp left exposed not because we did not know, but because at one level, what matters is capital, profit, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Money is being pumped into businesses in many of these countries, but much of the money is not reaching ordinary people. Much of the money is being used to sustain businesses which were already running at a loss and which were already being pumped full of money, public money, by various governments, okay? I mean, that is the, that's the process of neoliberalism that has been going on for 30 years, cut mm. public funding, cut public welfare, put money into banks and corporations, save them, okay? And then of course, this has been failing again and again, 2008 and so on and so forth. And it has been failing again the last four or five years. It was clear that things were bad and then along comes the virus and everyone says, aha, the economy is failing because of this stupid virus. Mm. But all the structures are still in place and they're doing nothing to, 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 to re-examine or contest any of those structures. And this is not, I'm not talking of India or, or, yeah. or, or, or China. I'm talking of all countries, it doesn't matter. China is supposed to be a communist country. 
in some mm -hmm. ways is different, but exactly the same structure. It's capital that matters and so on and so forth, the state-run capital. And, and of course, USA, UK, Brazil, all these countries. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we actually will see uh, certain disturbing trends even more exaggerated in the post-pandemic uh, situation? So. I think so. I think so, because most people have not even realized what's happening or, or the media is not giving them enough information. Most people cannot attain enough information. All alternatives have been dismissed. The only thing that exists is this kind of neoliberal capitalism. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I think this is this is this is a, a dress rehearsal. Something much worse <laughs> is going to come. Hmm. Uh, let me end with a uh, with with, um, you know, some of uh, some of your uh, lines, uh, you know, stayed with me even after years after completing your uh, novels. You know, for example, that line from uh, Jihadi Jain, you know, where you say that when goodness wants to become pure and alone, it becomes evil with yeah. a capital E. Yeah. My God, what a line. And yeah. uh, what exactly did you mean by that? Yeah, well, I mean, in some ways, of course, I can illustrate it with reference to say something like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, <laughs> because, you know, one way to, to look at that, that novella is to realize that Dr. Jekyll, unlike his lawyer friend, who is also part of the novel as that narrator, uh, cannot accept the fact that he's not perfect. He has some, some, some bad habit that he doesn't like, okay? He cannot accept that. So he decides to divide himself, get rid of everything. Mm. evil in him, everything negative in him. And of course, he ends up with Mr. Hyde, and Mr. Hyde takes over. <laughs> so mm. I think Stevenson, in some, some, some very prescient manner, was actually yeah. examining this, this issue, in the sense that, uh, which is not to say that we should not try to improve ourselves, but the fact is that it is in human nature to there are elements that we might not like about ourselves. We have to be aware of them. We have to learn to deal with them. We cannot separate them and believe that we are pure, we are good, okay? Uh, because that, of course, to me is the most frightening thing in the sense that this, this belief that I can do no wrong or my religion can do no wrong or my culture can do no wrong or my nation can do no wrong. And that's, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the root of uh, xenophobia, right? And, uh, you know, everything uh, that is seen as an outsider, stranger, is seen as the pollutant, exactly. right? Exactly. And uh, that is so, so um, applicable to today, where we see everybody as, uh, you know, a stranger, somebody who will bring disaster, and uh, so on. Let me just end with one kind of a comment that you made in a review recently, uh, where you said that uh, the... Uh, that the destinies of uh, Indian writers in English uh, is ruled by publishing and critical shakes sitting in London and New York. Uh, do, you, do you believe uh, that that is the case? That um, yeah. The, yeah. the destinies, that yeah. the, the, the reputations of uh, Indian writers in English yeah. are actually being, uh, if not manufactured, at least manipulated uh, you know, elsewhere. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm convinced. I've now I've been in this field for many decades, and I'm convinced that's the case. Uh, and 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 it, it has both uh, commercial and cultural sides to it. Mm. Uh, there's much more money uh, there, but there's also much more cultural prestige. Um, uh, I know a lot of radical writers who are also good writers who would who are radical in every way, but who would feel extremely flattered if they were published in say, well, I won't name these publications. Yeah. I can if they want, but these big uh, international publications uh, as if somehow they have been vindicated. Uh, and obviously all editors, all publications have their own agenda, their own way of seeing things, looking at things. Uh, so unless we can actually write, start writing for ourselves and with our own, which would include lots of differences in the sense that you, you, you might not agree with what I'm writing and I might not agree with what you're writing, but it's still, it's still being done with, with, with awareness of certain factors that we know from our own experience of growing up in different parts of India. Uh, and unless that happens, unless there's a kind of 
prestige associated with that kind of, uh, of, 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 of publication. Obviously, the, these, these more powerful forces, pub, public, publishing forces in richer countries would take over, especially when, it, when we are using a language like English. Hmm. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, think, so you think that there is a danger that writers tend to um, write what the publishers want to publish? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. No good writer does that. Okay, mm. but I think writers who who naturally write what publishers want to publish mm. are more likely mm. to be published and become famous. So they might be good writers. I'm not saying they're not good writers. Some of them might be good writers. But that's one way of looking at certain things. Yeah, are using language, and there are other ways too. But those other ways would always be obscured and overlooked because they do not find a big protector up there to take yeah. them okay. okay let me just end with uh, one question from the audience uh, this is um, uh, i don't see the name it only says galaxy tab um, you are in your book on uh, muslim modernities uh, you speak of how capitalism has shaped and how we see modernism and modernity do you think it is time we redefine these terms and make them more plural and inclusive of all cultures and nations irrespective of their economic progress? Uh, well, I mean, I, mean I, I don't really see modern um, Muslim modernities uh, uh, as, as a book because it was basically a compilation of essays and essays. papers that I'd written. Yeah. And Renu Call had very kindly collected them and published mm. them as an yeah. anthology. Yeah. So they were written for different publications, different occasions. But I remember this essay because this was one of the longer essays there. Mm. And it was actually quite an early work. I think I wrote it when I was still a PhD student or something like that. Quite quite an early work. And then I published it a bit later. Um, and uh, and I totally agree. I, that, that was actually one of my earliest critiques back in the 1990s, late 1990s, that, that the very notion of modernity needs to be not, 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 uh, not abundant, mm. but we need to look at how modernity is a much more complex crea creation. Now, I mean, a lot of books exist now uh, yeah. around this line. And modernity is not something that the West or England uh, endowed on the rest of the world. It was always a collaborative and combative activity. Yes. And that's yes. how it came into being. And, 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 and the problem is that very often, whether it's uh, Hindutva uh, bhaks or whether it's uh, Islamic fundamentalists, uh, they tend to say, oh, modernity, West, ah, out. Mm. Now, that's throwing out things to which we have contested, to have contributed to. We're throwing out traditions that belong to us as well. Mm. There were very democratic and secular, I would say, again, bad words, secular, yeah. in India, secular traditions in India. And they mm. have nothing to do with England. Or France, or whatever, and and we we cannot throw out the baby with the bathwater, and that's basically essential to any kind of future, yeah. um, and any kind of real identity of our own. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Tabish, and thank you very much uh, yeah. for your patient uh, reply to all the questions that we managed to. I don't know if I missed any question. I don't think I have. But uh, in any case, if there are questions, I'll forward them to you, and Please then do. we can always, uh, you know, send it back to the uh, person who has asked the question. Thank you very much, uh, Tabish. Thank you, and, Leah, uh, and thank you, Grida, and thank you to all of you listening to me, especially people. I'm told from my old school, Nazareth Academy. I, I'm told that some of them are also listening, <laughs> and from Gaya. <laughs> but, but, Wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Giri. Thank you, uh, uh, Tabish, once again. And uh, on behalf uh, of um, on behalf of Hyderabad Literary Festival, my colleagues Ajay Gandhi, Amita Desai, and Kinnara Murthy, I thank you once again. And uh, I would like to end by repeating an announcement for the next session. The next session would be on Friday at 7 p.m., 24th July, and uh, we are bringing you a discussion, a conversation with an absolutely new book which is actually yet to be uh, released formally, which is coming out on 13th of this month. And we will have a discussion on this book. And this book is titled The Indian Army and uh, the writer um, General <clears throat> uh, uh, Panag, General Panag would be in conversation with uh, Major General Shravan Kumar. This would be on 24th of July. And of course you will receive information 
uh, from us. Thank you very much, uh, all of you who have been with us this evening. And uh, thank you once again, Tabesh and Giri, uh, for joining uh, HLF. And once again, uh, thank you, uh, everyone here who has, uh, see, who has been with us both on this platform as well as on YouTube. Thank you very much. And I hope to see all of you and many more of you uh, next, at the next meeting. Thank you very much.